now? I guess so. So the thing that, that we want to do now is, okay, we know that doing the, I mean, solving the channel cooling problem is we have to construct an key matrix that is gonna allow us to introduce the redundancy. And if we have a factor graph that is given by the H matrix, we have an algorithm that give us the bitwise map solution, okay? As I said, the algorithm is approximate when we have loops. Okay. So the idea of the low density parity check codes is trying to build a code that have few loops. Okay. The first thing is, or the question that many of you could be asking is, can I go through an, an H matrix that have no loops? You can. Will you do, will do good? It will be crappy. So you have to have loops in order to have enough redundancy. If you have no loops, you don't have enough redundancy and it's gonna do terrible. Okay? So you have to have enough loops to have enough redundancy to do good, but you don't, have, you don't want to have too many loops. So the algorithm that we are assuming that works, it doesn't work. Okay? So this is the, the idea that we have. So if we have very few ones in the parity chip matrix, we should expect few loops. Why is that? Because remember that the ones in the parity chip matrix were designing how many lines do I have to put in here. If I have a few, few ones, I will have very few lines, and hence there is less risk of having loops. You can imagine that it's pretty easy to go from one to another, back and forth. If I only put two lines, I'm not gonna have any loops. Okay. As soon as I put many, many lines, the risk of having a loop is much higher. Okay? So when if that happens, it locally will look like a tree. And we will see a few examples of that. So if instead of running the message passing algorithm the full way, I just do it halfway, or until central point before the information gets repeated, I know that I haven't done anything wrong. Okay. That's the hell, the, the 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 point of using this in, in channel code. Okay. What is that doing? So the thing is, if I stop at some point, it means that I instead of fulfilling all the parity check constraints, I'm only fulfilling a few of them. You see an example. And if that is good enough, why should I need to continue? Okay. So this is why these codes work so good. Okay? So we have to put enough number of ones in order to have good code. And what David Mackay showed is that if we get the density, the parity check then, uh, matrix, and we put three ones per column, it works pretty good. That was his, his view. If you put three ones per column, so each one of these variables on the left hand side, they have three links, the, the codes were very close to capacity. That's what we're gonna uh, see now. Okay. What does three ones per column mean? Okay. So I just put here uh, an example where we have it's a matrix of five by 10. So I'm assuming that I have a channel capacity of one half. And I put three ones per column. Okay? That doesn't look as far. There is a lot of ones and very few fields. Okay? But let's make it larger. Let's make a, a 10 by 20. And now we have more series. And if we have 250 by 500, Okay, and probably in the next one. Okay. And in the next one, you wouldn't see any points. Okay. This is what we call low density. Okay. That is the, I think this is 1,000 by 2,000. Okay. And in all of this, we have three dots. In each one of them. Okay? I did it in a way that being uh, 
of raised one half, we're going to have six dots in each one of the co in, in each one of the rows. Okay, so that's what we call a regular <coughs> three six LDBC plot. Okay, we have a low density parity chip matrix. Okay, that has three ones in each in each column and six ones in each row. Okay, and this is the result that in ninety six, David Mackay showed it is very close to to capacity once you make the matrix. Okay. And now what we're going to see is what what David showed. It was it was very close. The thing is, what he didn't show is how close it is. Okay. The thing that we want to do today is see how close it is. Why it doesn't get to capacity? And what can we do in order to get to capacity? These are the the roadmap. I don't know if we're going to get that far today, but if not, we will see that on. My my idea on Monday is to continue with this with this thought. In the morning and in the afternoon, we'll probably try to to program these LDPC codes so you can see how it works. And actually, it's it's very very simple. Okay. So it's just to do a so you you don't have to listen to me. So, how do we know that LDPC codes are good? Okay. So, in order to do that, the first thing that we're going to do is use a very, very simple channel model. Okay. And this is the binary erasure channel. Okay. Then we're going to have a simplified message passing algorithm, this belief propagation. I'm sure some of you have heard about it before, that it was only the belief propagation algorithm done for factor graph into what is called the Pilling decoder. Okay, that is how it's known the belief propagation algorithm when you solve it for the binary erasure channel. You know, I mean, once you see it working, you understand why it's called the Pilling decoder. Then we're going to analyze the behavior of the code. We're going to analyze the behavior of a 3 6 code. Okay, and we're going to understand why it doesn't get to capacity. And then we're going to propose a linear programming method in order to optimize the codes to get to capacity. Those are the uh, steps that we're gonna follow, okay? So we're gonna have, uh, and this is allows us to see why all the PC that could and, and, why, uh, and why they achieve capacity, okay? If you remember before, I said that LDPC codes almost achieve capacity, okay? What I'm gonna show today or Monday, is that for the binary ratio channel, <coughs> the LDPC codes achieve capacity. And these were the first code that with linear complexity or almost linear complexity achieve capacity. For the Gaussian channel and the binary symmetric channel, which are more realistic channels, the solutions are very close, but not yet <coughs> capacity. Okay? And we will see why is that. This is why I said almost, because not in every channel they do a, a, a Okay. This is the binary ratio channel. Okay. If you remember the box, okay. So the zeros and ones are the ones that I'm putting into the channel, and on the other end. If I get a zero, I know that I transmitted a zero. If I get a one, I know that I transmitted a, a one. If I get a question mark, the symbol was erased. Okay? That's it. Okay? And the probability of having an error is going to be epsilon, and I'm going to assume the bits, the zeros and ones, are equally likely. Okay? They are probable initially. Okay? The back. It's a simple channel. I mean, I could, for example, there is another channel that is called the, the binary symmetric channel that maybe some of you have seen. That might seem as simple as that. Okay? In which, if, you, if I get a zero, it's a have probability one minus p that it came from a zero, and probability p that it came from a one. Okay? 
the binary ratio channel is very simple because at the other end we either know everything so if we get a 0 or a 1 we know that we transmitted a 0 or a 1 or we are completely clueless if we get an erasure we don't know if it was a 0 or a 1 okay? so in this channel what is going to happen is that once we get a 0 we know that was a 0 transmitted I don't have to put any uncertainty over it If you remember, Neil was talking about that you always have to put some uncertainty. In this channel, you don't need to put any uncertainty. OK? If you get an erasure, your uncertainty is total. You know nothing about it. OK? So it's, it could go either way. OK? So let's look at the message passing algorithm for, for, this, for this channel. And the good thing, we're going to see that the message passing becomes a very simple group. Okay? In both of them, it becomes a, a very simple group. Okay? So the initial message will be for x2 to a in this model. It is going to send the information that it got from e. So the message is going to be if, x, if y2 was a 0 or a 1, it's going to tell a I'm a 0 or a 1. If the message, if y2 was a race, it's going to say 50-50. I know nothing about what I am. OK? And then we see the message that x2, that a sends to x2. OK? And let me write it down, because I think it's going to be easier to see. sum for x1 and x3 being 0 and 1, all the possibilities. Okay? So we have f of a of x1 equal to 0, x2 equal to 0, So I will be doing that sum. What is this factor equal to? 1 or 0? It's a parity check factor. So the parity of this one is all or even. Even. We have four zeros. We have three zeros, so the parity is even. So the parity constraint is true, so this one is going to be a 1. Okay, so we can erase that. This one is going to be odd, so it's going to it's going to be a zero. So we can erase the whole thing. This one is going to be even or odd. It's one zero one. So it's going to be even. So it's going to be one. And the last one is zero, zero, 001, so it's again odd, so we're going to erase the whole thing. 
Everybody happy with that? So let me put that thing over here. Okay, so basically the message that I guess X2 is the multiplication of the one, one message from X1 and X3 and the zero, zero message from X1 and X3. Message that if in case x2 is equal to 1, you can do the same thing that I did before, and you will find that we get the multiplication of when x1 is equal to 1 and x3 is equal to 0, or when x1 is equal to 0 and x3 is equal to 1. Okay? It's exactly the same, the same computation. Okay? So what happened? Sorry, that would be an x3 then. If x1 or x3 are erased. So if either are erased, it means if x1 is erased, it means that this is going to be 50, uh, 0 0.5, and this one is going to be 0 0.5. Okay, and the same thing over here. Okay, let's assume that x3 is not erased and it's equal to one. So if x3 is equal to one, this value is going to be 0 0.5. And this value is going to be zero. This value is going to be zero. And this value is going to be zero point five. Okay. So if either x one or x three or both are erased, the factor will tell to x two, I don't know anything about you. Everybody sees that? This is important because that's basically the whole operation that we're going to be doing. Okay? So we said that Q of X1 to A is a race. And x3 we know was a 1. Okay. If we do the same thing, we erase x3 and we de-erase x1, you can see that the same thing happens. And if both of them are erased, what you're going to get is 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 in the fourth term. So again, we get an erasing error. Okay. But if x1 is not erased, We know that x1 is equal to 0 and x3 is equal to 1. This value is 0. This value is 0. This value is 0. And this value is 1. OK? So what we get in the message that the factor sends to the node is if any of the other message that I get is an erasure, I cannot tell anything about x2. If I know any, if I know all the other messages that I'm getting, I have total certainty about what x2 is. Okay. This is why the binary, uh, the binary erasure channel, the BEC algorithm, the BEC channel, is so simple. Okay. Because the message that goes from the factor to the variables is either I know nothing about you or I know that you're a zero or a one. Okay? That's the thing. 
And then after the first iteration, what do we get in X2? So in X2, we get the message that came from, uh, from E2. So we know the prior information that we have. We have the message that came from A that has all the information about X1 and X3. And we know that information that came from B that is all the information that we have for X5 and X6. Okay? So after one iteration of the algorithm, we can compute P of X2 given Y2, Y1, Y3, Y5, and Y6. Clear that I'm not that good with the keyboard. Okay? And here we have something opposite. Okay? So before, the factor needs to know all the other values before it can tell anything about the value. Okay? But in the variable, just look. If one of them is not erased, we get that what is the value of x2. So okay. we assume that this one was erased. Okay? So this is gonna be 0 0.5 for both. If we assume that this one was erased, it's gonna be 0 0.5 for x2 equal to 1 and 0 0.5 for x1 for x2 equal to 0. But if this one is not erased, it's going to be either 1 for x2 equal to 1 or 1 for x1 equal to 0. So when you multiply all of them together, you get a 1 for one of the values of x2 and you get a 0 for everything else. Okay? So the factors only tell them the variables that they know what they are when they know all their neighbors. But the variables, as soon as somebody knows what they are, you can de-erase them. Everybody says that? So the rules are very simple. You just need to look for factors in which all the variables are erased except one. Because that factor can tell something about the variable that is missing. And then that variable is going to be de-erased. Okay. So as soon as So let's assume that I have this factor with these five variables. And I have a 1, a 0, a 1, and 2 erased. Okay? The information that these three get, I don't care, because I already know what they are. The information that this one gets, it comes from a 0, a 1, a, a one and an erased. So if this was, was a 1, this would be a 1. If this is a 0, this would be a 0. So I cannot say anything about this variable. And the same thing happening here. Okay. But as soon as I know that this is a 1, the information that comes through here is in order to fulfill the parity check, you need to be a 1. Okay. So the belief propagation algorithm, when you use it over the binary erasure channel, the only thing that you have to do is look for factors that has only one erasure then apply the message to factors, and you de-erase it. And then you look for another factor, and so on and so forth. And you iterate through the factors until you get to the solution. Okay? It's, linear to s it's easy to see that it's linear, the complexity, because in here you have n minus k factors. So at most you will go through all of them. Okay. So it's linear in the number of bits. Okay. And it's just looking for, for a factor that has only one equation. Okay. So this is it. Okay. So let's do a, a very simple example. Okay. So let's assume that blue is zero and red is 1. And here, instead of marking the factors 
we just, instead of marking the factor of, as far as each here, that's basically what they are, we are telling something else. So we know that if we have a factor <coughs> with only two variables, and it has to be a parity check, we know that both variables are either equal, they have to be either two zeros or two ones. They have to be two reds or two blues. Okay? They cannot be red and blue because they will uh, not fulfill the condition. And when we have a factor with three inputs, okay, so we either have three blues, which are three zeros, or we then have one blue and two red, that will also make it part of the series. All the other combinations are not possible. Okay? And then from the message that we get is we know that B1 and B3 were reds, and all the others has been in reds. Okay? So the message, the first message that we get is we're getting this factor is telling him red, this factor is telling B3 red. One thing, I changed from X to B because I used this from a co-author of mine and he wrote it in B. But it, there will be the X's that we've been talking about all the time. Okay? Yes, yeah, so I was too lazy to redo the graph. Okay? And then the message that you're getting from these guys initially didn't have any information, so they are telling you you're erased, you're erased, you're erased. All of the messages are erased messages. Okay? So the first iteration is from factors to variables, and the only thing that we got is these two are telling these two guys that they are not erased. Okay? The next thing that we get is from variable to the factor. So this variable and this variable are telling what they know is I know I'm right. And the other three are telling them I know nothing about myself. Okay? Now we do the next iteration that is from factors to variable. And we get now, like this one was red. Now you get this message that is array. Because remember that V1 already told that factor that he was red. And that factor knows they have to be equal. So that message over there is you have to be red. The message on top is you, I don't know what you are. But once you know what you are, you don't have to worry about it. Okay? Because I already have this red label over here. Okay? So these three you get nothing, and those three you get nothing. And in the next thing from the variable is V2 has been turned red, and it's sending a message that I'm red and red. Okay? And in the next one, the one on top, it says there is, has to be either one or three blues. I already knew that there were two reds, so it's only one blue. So it's telling them it has to be blue. And in the last one is one B4 is blue, and it has to be equal. Uh, you get a, a B5 to B3. Okay? So pretty simple, the algorithm. Okay? This is what it's going to allow us to solve the, uh, uh, the message passing algorithm in a, uh, in a very simple way. There is another thing that I wanted to talk about, which is, okay, the way you implement this algorithm is even simpler than that, okay? So, what is that? I mean, the algorithm is very simple. A variable is the erase. If it gets a message from any of the factors, that is the erase. And a factor sends a message to some variable that is the erase, that you know what the value is, if you know every other guy. Okay. That's the thing. The pid and decoder, the way you implement the pid and decoder is very simple. Okay? So, and this is something that you can do very, very easily. Okay? Let's assume for the first time. Okay? That all the variables that I, that I, I transmitted are zeros. Okay? And then we'll, we'll look what happens when I transmit zero and one. One thing that is important is, like we're using linear codes, the all zero word is also a possibility because it's a linear code. Okay? If you put all the m bits to zero, all the x, x bits are going to be zero. 
Okay? So let's assume I transmit the O0 voltage. Okay? So what I'm going to get are either zeros or question marks. Okay? So the first thing that I do is I remove from the H matrix. Okay, remember that I have my half my H matrix. Or I remove from the graph all the variables that I know. So I remove all the variables that I know from the graph. Okay? Once I do that, the only thing that I have to do is look for check nodes with only one output. Okay? If you want to look that in the parameter check matrix H, if you remove all the bits that you know, you cancel all the columns that are not in error, you have to look for rows that have only one one. Okay? That is the, the way you implement the algorithm. Once you know that you find a row with one one, like all the things that I was transmitting are zero, you know that that array value was a zero. Okay? So the algorithm, the only thing that it does is look for factor nodes with one output, with rows with one output, Okay? And the array is that value. The good thing is this variable was connected to this one, this factor, and another two. Remember that all the variables have three connections. So every time I de-erase one of the variables, I'm taking two ones out of other two active factors. So if these two factors, if this factor had another variable here that was unknown, before it had two connections, once I know this one, I will be able to know which one it is. Okay? So what the algorithm does is, before, remove all the known variables. Then it looks for a factor that has one output, de-erase that variable, and remove that variable. And you continue until you get to the end. Okay? For zero, it's pretty easy. It's pretty easy. When you have zeros and ones, what it happens is, if you get a variable that is a zero, you just remove it. If you get a variable that is a one, you remove it, but you change the parity of the factor. Okay? So, let's go back to our, our first example. So if I remove that variable that is a one, I say that the parity is odd. <coughs> if I remove a variable that is zero, I don't change anything. If I remove a variable that is one, I say the parity is even. If I remove this variable that is a one, I say the parity is odd when I have only one connection. I say this guy is over. Clear enough? Okay. So the good thing about doing this thing is what I'm doing, and this is what it call, it's called the filling decoder, because you can see that you're filling the graph, taking out what you know. In, in, bit, in, in little by little. Okay? This is the thing that I want you to implement on, on Monday and to see, and then we have to run it and see that the probability of error is very close for channel. That's the, that's the only thing that you have to do on this. I'll, I'll write some code and give it to you so it's not, it's not gonna be that, that complicated. But I think the, the idea is, is pretty simple, okay? This is what allows us to analyze the code in a very, in a very simple way. What we did, or what Juanjo did in here, is applying this algorithm the same way, and I think it's easier to do, okay? So what you get is, it's the same thing that we have, it's your red, red, and three unknowns, 
So the first thing that we do is we remove the links. Okay? We remove the link of the known variables, which is that one and that one. The parity check is said if we are equal, so if that one is red, now it becomes you have to be red. And in the other one it says one or three are blue. Now you cannot have three blues, you can only have at most two, so one is blue and the other one is red. That's what the other one is saying. And the last one we have nothing. So now we pick the first factor that has only one output and, come and move the red to here and we remove the outputs of the, of the red one. So remember that this one, it says that you, there was one of them had to be blue. Okay? So then B4 now is blue, and the last one that you get is a blue thing. So to start this, you are assuming that there, is ex there exists a factor that only coincides with one erasure, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, the thing is, let's put it this way. Yeah. So I mean, otherwise, you wouldn't be able to do we, it. We're going to get that in a minute. Okay? So let's put it this way. We're using an H matrix, okay, that has, oh, let, me, let me put some. We have an H matrix that has n half rows. Let's say that we have 100 rows and 200 columns, okay? And each one of the rows have three ones. Each one of the columns has six ones, okay? Now, the channel capacity that we talk about for the, for the binary, the channel capacity for the binary erasure channel is 1 minus epsilon. So if I'm using a rate 1 half code, it means that at most I can correct 50% of the errors. Okay. So let's say that I put 40% of errors. Okay. And I get my columns. And I, I'm going to remove 60% of the columns. So initially, all my rows have six ones. But once I remove 60% of the, of the columns, I'm going to have rows with zero elements, rows with one, two, three, four, and six. Okay? So the first thing that I have to do is I look for all the ones that only have one one, and I do this process. What can happen? Okay? So your question is, can the building decoder fail? And it can fail. So if at some point, you run out of factor nodes with only one output, then you're stuck. And the pinning decoder fails. Okay? And that can happen because, I mean, the first reason that you can have is because you have too many errors. Okay? It's easy to see that if everything gets erased, there's nothing you can do. But if you get a 90%, if you, if you get anything above 50% for a rate one half, you're, you're not going to decode the whole one. You might decode some bits, but you're not going to decode the whole one. Okay? Even I'm going to show you that the amount that you can decode is 42, 42.9% of the errors. It doesn't get to 50%. And this is what I, we were showing on Monday. Okay? One thing that you can see in here, and this is what we put this example, is that if you look in here, the filling decoder fails. Okay? But the maximum a posterior solution is unique. Okay? And you can see that if you look at F1, F1 is telling us that V1 and V3, they have to be equal. Okay? That's what we get, isn't it? Mm -hmm. F1 is telling us that B1 and B and B3 have to be equal. Okay? So let's assume that they are both blue. Okay? Or let's assume that they are both red. Okay? Then if this is red, they are unequal, so this has to be blue. And then this one that has the three inputs, it says that only one or three have to be red. So that solution is not possible. 
Okay? So let's assume that V1 is blue. If V1 is blue, V3 is blue, and V2 is red. And that solution is possible. So if you try to do all the possible solutions, the eight possible solutions, there is only one that is true, that is blue, blue, and red. All the others are not binary. So there is a maximum that there is a maximum of posteriori solution, but that solution is not achieved by the Gewitz propagation. But that's something that, that we already know. In here, there is clearly a loop. And that loop is killing the algorithm. Okay? But I told you that it, it, was, it wasn't going to give you the optimal solution. Okay? We're going to see also on Monday that we can fix that problem using other machine learning algorithms. Okay? So let's put it this way. Yes, you can, I mean, the thing is, when you build your matrix, which is, you build it at random, you can have two columns that can be, that can be identical. Basically, that is telling you that you have a, a, a rank deficient matrix, and that means that you can transmit one more bit of the one that you could, okay? Because if you have one less constraint, that means that instead of having K message bits, I, get, I got K plus one message bits that I can do, okay? So you can always, or you can spot those things. There is, for example, the example that I put in here is a 3-6 code, okay? But if, for example, if you build a 4-6 code, four ones per, per column and, uh, sorry, four eight, four ones per column and eight ones per row, you know that that matrix is always track deficient. Because if you add everything together, and you have four ones in each one of the columns, you're gonna add to, to zero. So one of them is dependent on all the others, okay? When you do this thing at random, and you have to think that we only do this for thousands, tens of thousands, a hundred of thousand bits, the likelihood of that happening is very, very low. But instead of having a rate, and let's see that it happens. So instead of having a rate of 50,000 divided by 100,000, I get a rate of 49. That's not really going to change anything. Okay? And if you try these codes for very small matrices, they are crappy. Okay? This codes, the idea of these codes is when you go to high dimension, they provide random, random code words, and all the ideas that we have from Shannon, from Shannon of using random code words start working, okay? The good thing about them is that they are not just random code words that we have to use exponential complexity to decode it. They are random code words that have some order, and we can, you can use a, a linear algorithm in order to decode them, okay? So that's the, that's the whole point of, of doing that. But yet, those things can happen, those things can happen but you shouldn't worry about it. Okay, any other question? So I'm gonna let the analysis of how this works for, for Monday, okay? It doesn't, don't look. We only have seven more minutes. I think it's not worth it going into it. I'm gonna be stuck at the middle of it. I'm sure it's Saturday and you're all tired. Okay, so I'll see you here. It's uh, five past. Uh, five two, okay. Four forty five. We're gonna start today's lecture in the in the afternoon. Okay, we're gonna start fifteen minutes earlier. Everybody, not so I know that you hear me.